Welcome to the Siemens EDA podcast series on 3D IC chiplet ecosystems brought to you by the Siemens Thought Leadership Team. In our recent podcast on 3D IC topics, we talked about chiplet ecosystems, the design workflow needed for 3D IC, the current state of 2.5 and 3D SIP design flows, and the evolution required to support the design community to develop these 3D IC based devices. Today, we will discuss some of the front-end architecture, RTL-level design, and verification aspects of the 3 dic flow. I'm pleased to introduce two special guests today. Tony Mastriani, who is the Director of Advanced Packaging Solutions at Siemens Digital EDA, and Gordon Allen, Product Manager for Verification IP Solutions, also at Siemens EDA. Welcome back, Tony, and hello, Gordon. Thank you both for taking the time to talk with me today about 3 dic front-end architectural aspects. And before we dive into the discussion, would you both mind giving our listeners a brief description of your current roles and background? Sure, John. My name is Tony Mastriani, and I'm responsible for developing our two and a half and three D IC strategies and workflows at Siemens EDA. My background prior to Siemens has been primarily in IC design and mostly project management over the last uh, several years. I was involved in advanced packaging flows at my previous employer, which was a fabulous semiconductor. And there we were developing um, very complex integrated circuits for various customers. I was there about 18 years in the last three years or so. We started getting involved in 2.5D designs, uh, incorporating HBM interposers, as well as a design where we actually split a chip into uh, two dies that were integrated in a 2.5D package. While I was there, it became apparent that our traditional design methodologies needed some major enhancements. So for the last three years, I was working there developing our new uh, integrated packaging and IC design flows. Started about a year and a half ago at Siemens, as I mentioned, working on the two and a half and three D workflows. Hey, John, uh, thank you for the introduction and for inviting me to talk with you today. My name is Gordon Allen, and I'm the product manager for our verification IP portfolio here at Siemens EDA. My background is in SOC design and verification, stretching back to early 1990s, where I gained a broad knowledge from spec through to silicon. But my main area of expertise is verification. I was one of the architects and authors of Accelera UVM, and I've been with Siemens EDA for the last decade, bringing solutions based around system Verilog and UVM to our customers. Well, great, and thanks to both of you for sharing that stuff with us. Let's get into the front-end design topic for 3D IC. We're hearing a lot of talk in the industry about these technologies around 3D IC and the technical challenges. And many think these technologies and flows are dominated by physical aspects, packaging technologies, thermal stress, mechanical stress, all of those great problems that we have to solve and that we're putting flows into place for. But what about the front end of the IC design process, chip architecture and RTL design and RTL verification? Is that even relevant to this? And why are we talking about this? Yes, John, this this is very relevant. Traditional IC design scaling has been accomplished primarily through IC technology scaling over the the past 30 years or so. Uh, This process is referred to as design technology co-optimization. But as the uh, IC technology scaling has dramatically diminished, you know, with with Moore's Law, a new process named system technology co-optimization is extending this design scaling. This system technology co-optimization, referred to as STCO, is about enabling architectural and technology trade-offs early in the system design process to achieve high-performance, cost-effective solutions in a reduced time frame. Predictive modeling is a fundamental component of STCO that leverages high-level modeling tools during the planning phase to home in on an optimal solution. 3D IC design implementation requires co-design and co-optimization workflows. But before you jump into the back-end packaging flow, this decomposition needs to happen at the architectural level. But how do you do that? How do you even know what different options are available and whether they're valid for your requirements? And if so, how do you home in on the right microarchitecture where you're starting to partition things into blocks? 
Now, with 3DIC and chiplet ecosystem, those blocks may be blocks within an ASIC, or they may be separate chiplet blocks integrated into a package. These chiplets could be off-the-shelf devices, or it could be a full custom ASIC design. So to determine which microarchitecture is best for your application, you need to do some high-level predictive analysis quickly and find an architecture that meets your specific product requirements. Those requirements or priorities may include power, performance, physical size or footprint of the, the product you're building, non-recurring engineering cost, and, and the unit cost of, of the devices you're building, and time to market. So some customers will be designing at the bleeding edge of technology, while others will be looking for more of a Lego block type of approach, where they can just uh, put these chiplets together and, and snap them together like a Lego block to optimize their overall cost of these complex uh, system and packages. Now, going the chiplet route needs to be considered as an additional design paradigm. So let's look at what those multiple things, actually all of the usual concerns for any normal single die SOC project, architectural analysis, and then factoring in manufacturability, that would be test, package, thermal stress analysis, and the functional verification of your design, your interfaces, memories, processors, integration. And then there's physical assembly and verification, which is floor planning, timing bandwidth, signal integrity, and power. And we're looking now at ASIC interposers, packaging, and PCB techniques. So for the microarchitecture analysis and optimization, the idea is identifying your die-to-die -die interfaces and your typical components and the associated data interfaces, capturing those viable design scenarios, and then run your functional simulations and do some initial high-level analysis of the power thermal throughput. So this is the predictive analysis we need to do upfront. There is an analogy here. I think at the 3D package level, it's like doing upfront floor planning. And just as we must do SOC padring design today, now we're talking about synchronizing multiple padrings uh, within the package. And in my world, uh, which is RTL functional verification, there's the need to have functional verification of the off-chip and die-to-die -die interfaces with bandwidth and latency, overall design behavior, performance, throughput, and so on. All of these need to be measured. Ideally, we'd like to be able to do as much of this analysis as possible at this initial high level before the serious RTL development and integration begins. So the idea is we would go in and start selecting the packaging technology and then the chiplet ma mapping and interconnect, make some choices there, understand that high level floor plan and pad rings. And then we would do the mapping to target implementation where we can look in more detail at verifying our PPA uh, and the tool flow can enable more detailed floor planning and some rough routing of some of the channels to do some preliminary signal integrity analysis uh, and so on. And there we're getting towards the collaboration between the system designer or RTL architects and the package architects and, and design teams who would assess those deeper back-end concerns. Yeah, okay, you've got me convinced it's necessary to get started with the uh... 3D IC process up front. So let's look at the front end design and verification aspect of 3D IC. What do the SOC architects, design leads, verification leads need to know as they take steps into the new flows for their upcoming projects? Right. There's several areas here that we can discuss. One is architectural decisions around the packaging, partitioning, reuse that affect the IC's functional architecture. Second would be interface connections how to communicate from die to die and how to design that communication channel. Third would be interface verification, how to integrate and verify all of those die to die connections using standard protocols and memory interfaces. Yeah, that's right. In uh, any 3D IC project, certain packaging and partitioning decisions will be made up front from fixed criteria and experience. And others will be decided during the course of the architectural exploration and definition phase by evaluating several options and choosing one that meets the evolving requirements. Still others will be deferred until the project has sufficient technical unknowns resolved to finalize these decisions. You could see that 
the introduction of this new technology has an impact here. Actually, it brings a great opportunity that was not previously available to chip architects. But with that comes a need to consider the impact on the whole design flow, manufacturing flow, and associated cost. Right. And packaging and partitioning is hard enough in a single die SOC flow. Um, but now we're introducing chiplets as solutions for reuse, for integration, for handling disparate power or other technology aspects. The, the chip architect needs to evaluate and narrow down the options early on in the process. And the key message is here, you've got a lot more tools in your toolkit and one more degree of architectural freedom that you didn't have before. Now, it's, it's a problem, but there's room for optimism here. It's a good problem to have. We believe that 3DIC is a topic that every front-end design lead or SOC architect needs to be informed about today. In fact, there's two new things just announced in this last week which are, are relevant here and which will help change the game for 3DIC technologies. I want to mention them both during our discussion today. First up is the new industry consortium announced on March 2nd, the Universal Chiplet Interconnect Express Standard, or UCIE for short, rhymes with PCIE. This has several major market players bringing together the best of PCI Express Gen 6 technology and Compute Express Link, or CXL, technology into a proposed interface standard for die-to-die -die communication. UCI Express will leverage the PCI Express Gen 6 interconnect and physical layer to provide a known quantity, robust, fast die-to-die -die interconnect, letting you as architects make partitioning decisions your own way, knowing that the interconnect can be a solved problem. We anticipate that this will help with the expected ecosystem of chiplets available for integration and packages. And of course, uh, UCIE joins a list of other contenders for that die-to-die -die interconnect, XSR, USR, AIB, and others. But we really see its potential here. So clearly there are a lot of concerns to juggle early in the chip definition and development project before we go off and write RTL and verify it. You mentioned that in some respects, this is just like a normal SOC design process, but just more. Can you comment on some aspects that are particularly interesting or enabled by the adoption of 3DIC and chiplet technology? One area of interest, I think, is functional safety and redundancy. We see in certain markets like automotive, redundancy is a big deal because it's a harsh environment. So you need triple redundancy in hardware and software systems if that chip is going to drive the car. So they're going to use different architectures. So if one fails, they have a backup but even on the interconnect in 3DIC, these things are, are like tiny little bumps on a substrate or interposer. There's a lot of vibrations going on in the car, so there's going to be some finite risk of mechanical failures and so on on those connections. This uh, necessitates smart technologies baked in with redundancy and repair techniques, or R&R &R for short, that are supported today, for example, with HBM memories and in some of the other interconnect protocols. It's going to be required uh, for automotive applications. That's a good point. In um, harsh environments such as an automobile, the uh, internal die-to-die -die interconnect on the interposer, which connects the chiplets together, can fail from either electromigration or mechanical stress. And for these types of designs, redundant routing channels can be deployed. So test hardware and, and methods are available to detect and actually repair these defects by rerouting the failed channels to redundant channels uh, that are uh, designed into the interposer. This approach can also detect and repair memory defects. Additionally, as you mentioned, redundant internal blocks or even chiplets can be deployed in the system and then swapped in on the fly during the operation of, uh, of the device if uh, one of those components or, or devices uh, is not functioning properly. It's interesting what multiple chiplets brings uh, to this problem. Some aspects of functional safety should be considered up front at the architect stage. There's multiple levels, the concept of redundancy within the package or within the die, as well as out with the package multiple levels of potential redundancy. So a chiplet approach could help deal with your multiple redundant elements, which are now off on separate chiplets. So they're unaffected by point failures in common mode concerns like power, thermal, mechanical. If one of the chiplets fails, the other two are going to survive and still drive the car. That's a very interesting conversation, guys. So 
What are you in EDA doing to help front-end chip design and verification teams who are looking at partitioning and interconnect or architectural definition, redundancy? That is, what flows and solutions do you have here? We've heard a lot in other podcasts about different parts of the flow. Um, my own speciality is in verification IP. We provide solutions for PCI Express Gen 6, for Compute Express Link CXL, for advanced memories, DDR5 and HBM3 memory interfaces. And we have customers across multiple markets, processor makers, memory leaders, SOC makers, aerospace and defense leaders. They're all interested in this technology. One of our areas of strength is the automation we provide to auto-generate test benches and let design verification teams get up and running in minutes. This kind of productivity enables architectural exploration of the, the sort that we're talking about here and will give early confidence in the solution space that our architects are looking at. And you can be sure that we'll be providing solutions for the emerging 3 IC interfaces such as UCI Express as part of uh, Siemens EDA overall end-to-end -end flow for 3 IC. As an industry, we're, we're making a bet on this in that we can tip the balance financially and technology and help customers achieve more complex designs by uh, disaggregation decomposition by deploying STCO. And with this disaggregation, we can have multiple teams each working on their respective domains, making verification easier to divide and conquer. So we help those teams make their architectural trade-offs and their early experiments and exploration. As Gordon said, we can provide verification IP and workflows that help to automate the rapid generation of these scenarios for exploration, and then ultimately the rapid generation of more detailed scenarios once we're honing in on a chosen architecture, so that we can go in to the packaging implementation flows with all of this upfront design completed, including the architectural design and the upfront RTL verification knowing that we have a solid solution that's going to meet our functional goals going into the packaging flow. So earlier you mentioned that there are two pieces of major news this past week. We talked about uh, the UCI Express already. I'm curious, was the other one related to Apple's new M1 Ultra Processor chip announcement? Is that causing a stir? Yes, indeed. It was like a one more thing, a major 3D IC announcement from Apple that we'll talk about. But first, the audience listening to this podcast might be in all kinds of different end-use markets for their ICs. And the question is not which markets are relevant for 3D IC. It's becoming more like which markets are not relevant for 3D IC. It looks like this technology is applicable to multiple markets. We've been talking with customers from Milero and Space all the way to high-performance compute and consumer applications. As I mentioned, 3D IC is a topic that every front-end SOC design or verification team should make themselves aware of. The innovations that we see from the market leaders, such as Apple, will surely ripple down to all of us. Consumer applications. So take a look inside your Apple Watch or your iDevice. Look at the new Apple M1 chip family. They all use chiplet and die-to-die -die technology with wide memory and package, for example. And in larger desktop devices like the Mac, we see the new M1 Ultra processor chip just announced last week by Apple. It uses eight advanced memory chips in the package for a total of 32 fast memory channels. That's 800 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. But more importantly for 3DIC, the main SOC in that package consists of two of Apple's existing M1 Max dies connected edge to edge by a silicon bridge. They refer to it as an interposer which hooks up over 10,000 signals that were pinned out along one edge of the existing M1 Max die to enable this doubling of processing capacity. That thing is about 47 millimeters long in total. The interconnect alone is 2.5 terabytes per second of bandwidth from die to die, which is more than four times the bandwidth that other multi-chip interconnect technology could provide. And what's interesting about this approach is that it looks like Apple architected it that way much earlier in the M1 design process with the floor planning and interconnect already there in the M1 Max chip that was essentially future-proofing their design. And now they have one of the fastest integrated processors and GPUs on the planet. So these boundaries are being pushed you know, by the top of the market, but we can be sure that the technology and design flows will trickle down and become more accessible to all. And that's part of our job as EDA 
we're going to see a healthy mix of proprietary and industry standard solutions on the menu. Also, we're seeing a lot of innovation coming from Apple and Intel and consortiums and foundries. What secret sauce is EDA working on for the front end? And what are the flows and solutions that will grow up with this emerging technology to help the front end architect and RTL teams? It's an interesting question, uh, John. As we previously discussed, uh, we offer the ability to capture alternative design scenarios, leveraging chiplets and 3D IC technologies, and the predictive models and workflows to assess each of those scenarios. So as the complexity of these systems increases, this, this can be a daunting task to, to generate and assess a multitude of uh, scenarios. So this challenge lends itself very nicely to leverage machine learning technologies to automate the generation, assessment, and optimization of the solutions to hone in and, and best meet the design requirements in a more automated and timely manner. So I think this is a key area of innovation that will uh, extend this technology adoption to a broader set of customers beyond the, uh, the current small set of very advanced users that are in this space today. Absolutely. And we encourage all of our audience to invest time in learning this from day one. And, and we're really excited to be investing to provide you the tools and the flows to help you do that. That's great. I want to thank you, Gordon and Tony, again for another highly informative discussion on front-end architectural design verification considerations in this episode of our 3D IC series. We're all out of time today, but we're looking forward to the next 3D IC podcast with you. Again, thank you both. And we want to thank all of you, our listeners, for listening to our podcast today. Yes, uh, thank you all. And thank you, John. Yeah, and thanks, John, for hosting. And uh, Gordon, great discussion. <laughs>